And now, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. In a moment, Act One of The Silver Shoe, written especially for suspense by Robert Reddick. say to yourself, well, that's the way it is. It's all over. Maybe if you care a lot for somebody like I did for Corey, maybe they go on living in a way in your mind. Not really living, but well, kind of living in your thoughts or your memory or your dreams. But that's all. So when I saw this girl sitting in a drugstore Two years after Corey's funeral. Well, naturally, I had to figure she was somebody who just happened to look a lot like her. I mean, wouldn't you? I wouldn't have been shocked if she'd just been sitting there at the counter drinking her coffee. But she was doing something that, well, I guess I'd seen Corey do a hundred times. She was holding a spoon, upside down, dabbing little strokes with it on her napkin, like it was a paintbrush, drawing imaginary little pictures on it. And when she spoke to the counterman, it was with Corey's own sweet, familiar voice. You let me have a check, please? Sure. What'd you have? Uh, egg salad sandwich and coffee. Okay, 50 cents, beautiful. I guess I must have looked pretty strange standing there, staring at her. But I couldn't help myself. You want something, buddy? Huh? Oh, yeah, a cup of coffee. Cup of coffee coming up. I watched her pay the check, watched every movement she made, every step she took as she walked out of the door. And there were Corey's movements, Corey's steps, every one of them. Kind of cute, eh? What? Nice looking chick. Uh, uh, does she come in here a lot? Yeah, once in a while. She's one of the dames who works down the street at the dance hall. Here's your coffee. Thanks, I don't want it. Here's your dime. Huh? Oh, sure, Tiger. I followed. I had to. A few doors away, there was an entrance lit up with a lot of neon and stuff saying it was a dance hall. And I saw her walk into it. I felt kind of funny about following her, but... Well, somehow, I, I couldn't do anything else. Inside, there was this sort of pink ceiling over a long flight of stone steps leading down into the dance hall. Well, I bought a ticket at a little booth at the bottom, and then I went into this big room where the music was playing. of other girls came running up to the railing and started calling out to me. Come here, sailor. I want to talk to you. Thank you. You got a cigarette, sailor? For sure. You always get the pretty one. <laughs> what made you pick me, honey? May I ask you, sailor? What made you pick me? Well, I... I can't see very well to smoke this when it isn't lit. How about you dig down in your bell bottoms, honey, and bring a lady up a match? Oh, I, I keep them up here in my breast pocket. Well, good for you. <laughs> Aren't you 
Mr. Stein over the entrance, honey. Fifty girls, fifty gorgeous, exotic dancing partners. Hmm? Well, of course, even when this joint is jumping, there's only 22 of us. But I mean the other part. Do you think I'm gorgeous and exotic, honey? Is that why you picked me? Uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't think I know what you mean. You know what gorgeous means, don't you? Oh, sure. Well, exotic means weird, honey. Strange. Come on, baby. Buy me some tickets. And while you're out there on the floor holding me tight in your arms, you can tell me how exotic I am. Well, I really came in here looking for somebody else. She's about five foot three and has light brown hair and blue eyes. Ha! Just like half the girls in America. Besides, if you don't see her, she ain't here. Who told you she worked here anyway? Here. Th- th- this picture in my wallet. She looks like this girl. No, somebody's kidding you. We ain't got nobody here looks like that. Oh, but I saw her come in here. Look, I ought to know. I've been working here for four years. I tell you, we got no girl like that. No. Why don't you just forget her and concentrate on me? Anything the matter with me? Oh, no. No, it's, it's just... You a... bet there ain't. <laughs> now, don't you run away, sailor. I'm going in and powder my nose. Don't let any of these other dames latch on to you. And when I come back, I'll show you the way a patriotic lady treats the Navy. away. I began to figure maybe I was mistaken after all about seeing Corey or this girl coming in here that maybe I lost her on the street, that it was somebody else I'd seen in the neon light. And I was just about to leave when I saw her again, sitting alone at a table in a half-darkened corner clear across the room. She was dressed different now in a sort of spangly silver gown that left her shoulders bare. She looked just like Corey did the night I took her to the McKendrick's ball. When a sort of a daze, I walked across the dance floor and over to the table where she was sitting. I guess she was thinking about something because she didn't look up until I was just about standing next to her. Hi. By yourself. I saw you upstairs at the drugstore. Did you? Yeah. She had a strange expression on her face. Kind of like I figured mine must have looked. Sort of surprised. And like she couldn't quite believe what she was seeing. You know something? Hmm? When I first looked up just now, it was almost like I knew you from somewhere. Yeah. Knew you real well. You seem to remind me of someone. I I, I can't remember who. <laughs> Isn't he a funny feeling? You know what I mean? She told me to buy her some dance tickets at the little booth. Well, I did. Then I came back and I sat down with her at her table. I, I told her of how... She reminded me so much of someone, too. Uh, I've got a photograph of her. I'll show it to you. There. That's Corey. Well, doesn't she look... Yeah, yeah, she does. I'm sorry about following you down here from the drugstore, but... Oh, that's all right, Joy. You don't have to apologize. I understand. How did you know my name? What? You called me by my name. How, how did... Oh, is your name Joey? Yeah, I did. Oh, well, that's just a habit of mine. I call all sailors Joey till I get to know them a little. How come? Oh, I don't know. Just like that. Look, let, let's dance, huh? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't dance very well. I... Oh, that's all right, Joey. Just, just hold me. <laughs> She took my hand in the same sweet, special way that Corey had a hundred times, a, a, a thousand times before. Gently, tenderly, with her fingers 
lightly laced in mine. I remembered that day more than two years ago when I was standing, leaning against the outside wall of my house. My eyes were closed because the sun was bright and my head was back because it was nice and warm on my neck. And while I was standing there, like that, Corey came over and quietly stood beside me that way, the same way with her head back and all. And she gently took my hand and placed her fingers in mine. And she said so softly that I almost couldn't hear her. It must be lovely on the beach. And I thought to myself, yeah, or on the dunes. And just as if she could read my mind, she said, or on the dunes. And the next thing I remember, I was lying on a blanket in a hollow with sand knolls all around. And the sun was blazing hot. Nice, though. And Corey turned over on the blanket, put her face next to mine, and, and she said, I love you, Julie. And when we're old enough, I want to marry you and have three children and live in a nice little house. And have many friends and books to read and records on a phonograph. And I want to die with you in my arms. And then she cried. I suddenly realized that I was holding this other girl in my arms. That we were dancing. Where did you learn that step? What? The one you just did. Well, I don't know. Just kind of like it. Well, you said you couldn't dance. <laughs> well, not very well, usually. Yes, to me, we dance just fine together. Comfortable and easy. Like two people have... Dance together a lot? Yeah. You're not 21, are you? No, 20. Oh, you're supposed to be 21 to come in here. Oh. Oh, well, we won't tell them, will we? Truth is, I'm only 20 myself, but they don't know that. Oh, is that right? Uh-huh. See, that's just the age Corey would... I'm sorry. I just can't help it. Oh, of course you can. You're so much like her. Oh, it's all right, Joey. I understand. You know, all the time we've been dancing, I've been lost in memories, too. Yeah? Yeah, but mine are funny, and, and, and they're vague. I keep getting a certain picture in my mind that makes no sense. What do you mean? Well, I see myself with a boy, the one you remind me of, in a park. Yeah? It's very quiet, and the full moon lights up his face. I, I can't figure out who he is. The picture's clear. We're, we're standing together looking up at a statue. The strange thing is I, I don't seem to remember anything like that ever happening to me. I guess it did, but I, I just can't seem to remember. But I could remember it. I could remember it very well. It was two years ago, and I was walking in Heatherton Park with Corey. There was a bright moon. Nobody else was there. Nobody in the whole park. And she stopped before the statue of Daniel Porter, who had said contributed more to the development of something or other than any other man in the state. She looked up at it as if she were going to mention something about it. She said, Dr. King says I'm not well. And I could tell from the way she said it that it was serious. We walked through the park without saying another word. And the next day she went away to the sanitarium. 
and three months later, she was dead. Joey, what is it? Hmm? What's wrong? She was asking me what was wrong. It was impossible to tell her. I was frightened. I tried to tell myself that there, there were other parts, other, other statues, other moonlit nights, but somehow I knew. Joey, you look pale. What's the matter with you? Could we go back and sit down? Sure, come on. Don't you feel well? I'll be all right. That that part you pictured in your mind, that statue? Yeah. You were standing with some fella looking up at a statue. Where was the moon? Low? Just just over his shoulder? Huh? Was the moon sort of low in the sky like it was sitting there right over the shoulder of the statue? I think it was. Yeah, yeah. How could you know that? And and, and were you, you holding his hand? Yeah. Ooh, with your fingers lo- locked in his like... And then suddenly I saw it. Cupped in her open palm. A small silver medallion that I'd made for Corey three years before. I cast it myself with a makeshift crucible and molds. She used to wear it on a chain. What is that? Where did you get that? What? That thing in your hand. Let me see it. Give it to me. Joey, what are you... Give it to me. I went across the table, grabbed it from her, but my hand struck against hers and she dropped it. Where, where is it? What is it? Where did it where fall? Is it going? It's too dark. I can't find it. Oh, Joey. Where did it go? Light! Give me some light! Joey! How did you get that medallion? How did you get it? Medallion, I had a coin in my hand. What are you talking about? That was no coin. Don't you think I can see? Oh, what's the matter? This guy drunk? No. Will you turn some lights on? Now, listen, Mr. Phil. Bailey, it's all right. You sure? Yeah. Okay, Muriel, but you better take it easy, Sailor. We don't want no trouble here. Oh, Joe, you don't know this right. place. You make any trouble and they'll... What is this all about? What are you trying to do to me? You listen to me for a minute. What are you lying to me for? I saw it. I saw it in your hand. Look, Joey, I mean it. You make any trouble or anything and they'll call the shore patrol. They will. Now, look, let's get out of here, okay? I'll turn in my tickets and change my clothes. We're not supposed to take dates out of here, so you go on up to that drugstore and wait for me. I'll meet you in a few minutes. After you're gone, I'll I'll find it. I'll find what you're looking for. So I went up to the drugstore and waited. I waited ten minutes, twenty minutes. I waited half an hour. And I went into the phone booth and I called the dance hall. This is the sailor who was in there a little while ago. So, what do you want? I'd like to talk to that girl I was dancing with. You know the one I mean. Girls can't come to the phone. Why not? Because they're working, that's why not. This girl I was with, she... I'm telling you they're all busy. Now get lost, will you? Now, you listen to me, mister. I want you to put that girl on the phone and... Look, sailor. Don't stick your head in a pail someplace, will you? And cool off. Hey, hey. Sailor? This the one? No. Look, you see this guy in here? Sure. 
Who is he dancing with? He wasn't dancing with nobody. What? I gave him a pitch, but he just walked over and sat down by himself at the back table in the corner. He just sat there staring at the table talk for about half an hour. Then he walked out. What are you? You remember me, don't you, honey? You gave me a cigarette. So what do you tell me you were dancing with somebody for? What's the matter with you? You came over to our table. Remember, I was looking for something. You're looking for something, all right. In just about a minute, you're going to get it. Now, pack up, you hear me? Not here, here, here. You see this? It's a picture of some dame. He showed it to me. He keeps saying she works here. I think it's cracked or something. You got the wrong place. She don't work here. Let's go. I'm telling you, I was sitting with her, dancing with her. Where are you? Are you down here? Where are you? You're really asking for it, boy. You know that, don't you? Get your hands off me. I said get your hands off me. Okay, buddy. Just about enough of you. Oh, you just... morning in sick bay on the ship i couldn't do anything but lay there and think about this girl i told the ship's doctor about it you've been under a great strain lately joey i'm going to recommend that your duties be suspended for a few days at least you want me to stay here yes in sick bay that's right what do you think i'm crazy or something you want to keep an eye on me I said you've been under a strain, that's all. I don't think you've ever really gotten over the shock of Corey's passing away. You've been thinking a lot about her lately, haven't you? I mean, in these last weeks, before you even saw this uh, other girl in the drugstore. Yes, I have. Well, isn't it possible that you simply wanted her back so much that that my imagination was playing tricks on me. Something like that, yes. I want you to stay right there in that bed. Well, I lay there for about a week. I guess I was just about convinced that's the way it was. I mean, it was the only thing I could think of that seemed to explain everything. One day they told me I could get up and they brought me my clothes. And then I found the silver medallion in one of my shoes. That's where it must have fallen when she dropped it. There was no question about it. It was the one I had made for Corey. At her funeral. At the reception. I had been the last one in line to look at her. I'd reached into the coffin and placed the medallion in her sweet, cool hand and gently curled her fingers over it. And then they closed the lid. I never told that to the ship's doctor. Do you think I should have? Listening to The Silver Shoe, written especially for suspense by Robert Reddick. Suspense is produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson. Heard in tonight's story were William Mason, Tony Darnay, Dick Keith, Rita Lloyd, Gertrude Warner, and Ralph Camargo. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Sound patterns by Walter Otto. Technical direction by Michael Schottkiss. This is Stuart Nett speaking. Listen again next week when we return with Pages from a Diary, written by Virginia Voland and starring Jim and Henny Backus. Another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense.